what I'd like you to do is turn your attention to the handout. I, I, you know, it's sort of a we're all sitting all over the place. But you see this handout? Did everybody get one of these? Yeah. Okay. And uh, we could talk for a long time about this, but we're not going to. <laughs> but I'd like you to flip to the second page that says our vision. And uh, who's who's familiar with this? Is anybody familiar with this, what this might be? Yeah. Okay. So what this is is this is actually in NAVDM. It's kind of an official document. I mean, this is like the vision statement of the navigators worldwide. worldwide. So, and this was quite an amazing thing. About 20 years ago, they had all these nav leaders from all over the world. I mean, just imagine, Latins, Africans, Americans, Europeans, all types of Asians, Middle Easterners, they got together and they actually agreed on this. Kind of amazing. So this is our vision statement. And we're not gonna take a long time in it, but I just wanted to give you a couple minutes right where you are to read it. And then note, is there any part of it that you're, you gravitate towards or that you resonate with? You're like, yeah, I like that, or I could, that's me, or however you want to put that. So let's just do that. Let's take uh, about three to five minutes and read through it, okay? And then uh, be ready, because I might ask you to share. Okay? <laughs> Which one? Mm -hmm. Fantastic mm -hmm. and Yeah, yeah. Second, is that what you said? Yeah. What characterizes this movement? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, no matter what kind of navigator you are, it's, that's a navigator's dream, is that anybody that's around us would feel that, experience that. But like any human, human put together organization, there's going to be moments that it didn't go that way, you know. Mm -hmm. so, but go ahead. No, there's a the fourth paragraph that says that they demonstrate, they yes. encourage. Encourage, yes. Yeah. Somebody, yeah. The, the first line of the last uh, paragraph. The leaders of this movement developed and empowered to both service, live out a growing commitment, commitment to Christ, Christ likeness. Yes. Yeah, the opposite of that would be to the leaders of this movement use their position for as much money and power as they can. <laughs> That's the opposite. So we we hope to do different. So yes, yeah. For me, probably my. I mean, I like it all, but my favorite. I better like it all. <laughs> for me, my favorite is the, the the paragraph that starts with ordinary people. Ordinary people, and and you know, I don't know exactly. You know how English is slightly different here than like in the states. And the, you know what I mean? There's slightly different nuances. In, in at least in the U.S., if you say ordinary people, you have to explain because it might come across as very like pedestrian. You know, kind of like ordinary people. But in this sense, when it says ordinary people, what it's just talking about is like regular people or like us. You know, just. Normal people, not like superstars or overly famous or any of that, but ordinary people who earn their living all sorts of different ways in many walks of life are leading integrated lives. And then this is how they live. They live as fruitful insiders among the lost. That doesn't mean they're leading tent revivals in their workplace, right? Or they're going into their boss's office and doing open-air preaching. I mean, I'm picking an extreme example. That's not what this is saying. But it says that you are the fragrance of Christ, where God has placed you. And you do that certainly with your actions and your lifestyle. And when the opportunity is there, you do it with your words. You know? You're not in the office just so you can share the gospel with everybody. You have a job to do. They're paying you to do something, right? Yeah. But there will be times because we relate to people, you know, and people want to know why do you live the way you live, you know, why do you, why do you really seem this or that? I mean, you're, you're ready to share. And uh, so I just love that. So that's really why I wanted us to look at that is to catch. I wanted you to just, first of all, be exposed to it. And I didn't know how many of you had really seen that or read that much. But uh, there's nothing in there that says a navigator is a paid navigator employee. 
A navigator is not an employee of the navigators. A navigator is someone who lives a certain way and views ministry a certain way. You know, we believe in things like spiritual generations, like he said. That's kind of one of our big things. It's, you know, like for me, success is when I'm helping a guy, can he repeat the process? That's how I know it, it, it worked, so to speak, you know. Um, so ordinary people. So we kind of throw around this term CIPs and GIPs. It's kind of an in-house technical term, but the idea is that like, some people are, are fully navigator, but they earn their income from their job. Some people are fully navigator, but they are supported by gift income because their their whole day, their whole work day is with the navigator. But we need both. So most of you, if not all of you, are what we would call CIPs, conventional income navigators. Our big question today is how do they flourish, right? How do they flourish for the long term? And of course, there's more than what we're just doing today. I know that, but we're trying to pick the two big, two big ones. And uh, I want to share that second element with you, but I have to give a little context first. Um, a little bit more on this GIP CIP thing. Okay, so even in the Africa region. There are, I believe, we're in 31 countries. Is that right, Amula? Top star in Africa. Yeah. Don't call me Nina. Right, I know. But, yeah. but we're in 31 countries. Some of those navigator ministries around Africa are pretty much run and led by uh, all conventional income navigators. Um, there's others where it's a lot heavier on gift income, like full-time people. And then there's a number of them where it's a mix. It's kind of a partnership. And I have to tell you, around the world, the healthiest navigator ministries are a mix. You know, you have to have somebody that does this full-time and, like, knows how to manage things like this and coordinate and they have the bandwidth to do it and... But then if we never have people bringing the gospel into places that someone like me could never go. See, that's the thing. You all go into places where I could never go. I mean, I can't show up at some law firm and expect everybody to listen to me. But you are God's ambassador there. And only you can go there. And those of you who run small businesses, you interact with all sorts of clients. Right? And other types of people, I can't go there. So the CIP has an advantage for access that someone like me does not have. I just have more time, you know. So there has to be a partnership between those two. So we're going to do another one of our little famous Bible studies, okay, right now. And we're going to look at Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 11. So read this kind of interesting passage, and I'm going to warn you, when you first read it, you're going to be like, why didn't he have us read this? But look closely at it, and think about what do GIPs bring, and you know what a GIP is now? It's a gift income navigator, right? CIPs, what do CIPs bring, and why are they both essential? So I think it's, it's buried in there, Acts 18. <coughs> 1 to 11. So I'm going to let you guys have a few minutes to do that. Anybody want to take a shot at that? What do you see in there? How does it speak to what I've just been talking about? I think I want to. Please, yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, it says that when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word. So, um, testifying to the Jews about, no, explain to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. Um, so, this kind of gives a sense of uh, Paul having more time. Because he was occupied with the water. What I what I get from that, he was more engaged in sharing the gospel with people um, than his friends, Priscilla and Aquila, were. Uh, even though we also know that they 
they were Christians, so they also sharing the gospel with uh, their profession, like mm-hmm. with the contacts around them. So that's kind of the difference between Paul and yeah. Priscilla and Aquila. I mean, I think you're really onto it. Um, anybody else? Comment for us out of this? Something you saw? Yeah, yeah. I, th- I, think, I think Paul transitioned from a CIP to a GIP. Um, he was a conventional income navigator. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> when he was <laughs> That makes sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> yes. When he was ten, when he was when he was ten Yeah. But then when Timothy and Silas came in, now he went full time. Yeah. And uh, now it wasn't just uh, a matter of weekend ministry. Yeah. That was now full time Monday to Monday. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's well said, and I think. Um, it's interesting here that he met someone named Aquila, and then it quickly goes into how they were all tent makers. So he probably met them through the business, don't you think? I mean, I don't know. Maybe he had some sort of recommendation about them, or I, I, who knows? There are definitely things we don't know for sure, but it's not a stretch to say that he met them through the business, because they were all in the same thing together. Um, and then, uh, and then it says every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue. And this is one of the things I would say is like, it doesn't say every day, it says every Sabbath. So like for a CIP, you have a job to do. You probably have a home to manage. You probably have kids, some of you. Whatever you have, you have things you have to do. So you cannot be like immersed in sort of ministry things all the time. Uh, it, your work is your ministry. It's a big part of your ministry. But you can do some, right? You can't do it like every day, but yeah, you can You can make time for things. You can make time for people. I, I mean, that's how I would like to encourage you is make time for people more than make time for organizations or structures. I mean, those are not bad, but it's, it's your neighbor. It's your coworker who might need you to meet him for dinner or something, you know? Uh, somebody might be ready if you ask them to read the Bible with you. They might be ready to do it. Um, so I like to point that out. And then you're right. I think Silas and Timothy showed up. And they're, it's not said, so what I'm about to say is pure opinion. But I think it's educated opinion. I think they showed up with some kind of support. Because why else would it say that they showed up and then he went exclusively, right? So they probably showed up with some kind of means so that Paul could just go full ball, full out, you know, what he's doing. And then it goes on to how uh, things went badly there, right? <laughs> um, but I do like how Paul went in the synagogue, but where else did he go? Look at verse 7. To the house of a Greek, Titius Justice, a worshiper of God. So this guy definitely had something good going on in his life. But this was not a, I mean, the, the fancy word for this is, this is not a cultic location. Do you know what I mean when I say that? Like, the synagogue is a cultic location. But this is a neutral area. And that is exactly what your office is. It is not some kind of spiritual, but Paul went right in there. He was in this guy's home. Next door, right? Yeah. So I just like this passage because it, it models so many things for us. Um, there's so many good things that we see. And then he had that vision. And then in verse 11, he, he just decided to stay for a year and a half. So there's another indication that probably he was a GIP at this time because not a lot of people can just go to a city and just stay there for a year. Right? <laughs> I mean, there's probably a few jobs out there, but not many. So, anyway, so Acts 18, 1 to 11, GIPs and CIPs. Um, one way I like to think about it is, what does it look like for a navigator who's in the marketplace? This is not a perfect statement, but I want to present it to you just for your thought. Pray big, work small. Pray big, work small. Here's what I mean. Believe 
the God of the universe to use whatever efforts you have among people to change the world. Because that's the God you serve. Pray big, right? But work small. Work with who God puts in your life. You know, you think about who's right in front of you. Fam extended family, neighbor, workmates, high school friends, whatever. Pray big, but work small. And let God take your five loaves and two fishes and blow your mind with what he does over a long period of time. Yeah. So, just to review this weekend, we're talking about flourishing. The first one had to do with walking with God, right? The second one is this, doing it with like-hearted friends. That is the second, I believe, vital element needed to flourish for the long term, is having like-hearted friends who are in this with you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Gotta have like-hearted people. There's Lone Rangers don't survive. So let's look at that Psalm 92 one last time and pull one other thing out of there. Psalm 92, remember this is the palm and the cedar. So I'm just going to take us there. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. Then what pronoun do we have there? They. Do you see that? That sneaky little pronoun. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. And then what? They, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. One thing we can agree on, Chris and Mulo, over the English language is that they means the same thing. <laughs> Mul America, multiple people. In American, sorry. No, no, no. In both. They refers to multiple. Oh, yes. There were there's more than one palm in cedar, right? This thing wasn't alone. He was he or she, whatever the palm was, was in the context of many. I like that it's right in that passage for us. We need others. If I can get you to flip over a few books to Ecclesiastes 4, verses 8 through 12. Now, you always got to be ready when you go to Ecclesiastes. It's full of wisdom, but boy, there's some bleak situations in there, aren't there? But listen to this. Ecclesiastes 4, 8 through 12. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with wealth, with his wealth. For whom am I toiling? He asked. And why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless. A miserable business, two are better than one, because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up, but pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if the two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Now, this, these, this passage is often applied to marriage. It can be applied, but this is not a marriage passage. Sorry. It's not. It's just, I mean, we can, if you're single in this room, you can be single, but that doesn't mean you have to be alone. You see, alone means like there's no voices in your life. And that's not singleness, you know. It's not the same. So I just want to put that to the side. This is, we are not talking about are you married or not. Okay? We're talking about do you have like-hearted, like-minded people in your life who think like you about things like the word of God and surrender and the people around them. Does that make sense? Do you have people who think like that? Do you know? Do you do you have people who would read like a vision like that and look at it and say, "Yeah, I, I, I want to be like that, or I want to be a part of that, or that's how I want to live." You know, we, we we need people like that. Now, I am from a generally individualistic society, so I am not going to stand up here and try to convince you all of why we need each other. Okay, that you guys could convince me. <laughs> And I know that. But maybe I can be a voice to encourage you to be together on mission. Together. 
Not just together, but together on mission. A mission that's on God's heart. It's clear that we need others. So how does this apply to flourishing? Well, God is a missional God. He is on mission. And we were made to join him in his mission. We are image bearers. We, we are the only living thing that reflects God back to him. And in order to be all that we were intended to be, in order to flourish, we need to, at some level, we need to engage in, in mission. And in order to engage in mission, truly, we need others to do it. So, look at John 13, 34 and 35. Jay, can I get you to read that for us? Thank you. John 13, verses 34 and 35. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Yeah. I think to fully appreciate what he's saying there, it's helpful to know what he's not saying. What he's not saying is, if you are a really good arguer about why following Jesus is the smart thing to do, everyone will know you're my disciple. Or if you are the uh, best dresser, they'll know you are my disciple. It doesn't say that. It says it's by your love, by how you love one another. Um, so that's what it's, it builds the case for why we need one another. I think my first exposure to be to to sort of being on mission together, my first exposure was at in university. I had a good friend named Phil, and he started bringing his friend Tom to different things we did. And, and I just got to know Tom a little bit, and pretty soon Phil and I started praying for Tom. And eventually Tom came to faith. And uh, he kind of belonged to our group before he believed, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, and then one day he said, I think I'm a follower of Jesus. Good. Um, but that was my first. Then my second one was, I did. I told you a little bit about my, when I was, uh, when I left the Navigator staff, when I was uh, in my 20s, and I worked in that uh, office. Well, I had a friend in that office who really wanted to reach out to the guys, too, and get to know them. His name was Daryl. And that made all the difference. Daryl and I would get together, I don't know, every other week. It wasn't even that often. And we'd pray for the guys in our office. And then we had little initiatives with them that made sense and fit. And I wasn't alone, you know? Now, it was great that we were in the same office, I'm going to admit, but we didn't have to be in the same office. That's usually not realistic, <laughs> that someone five feet from you is thinking like you. But I think the thing I just want to point out is, is we need others. Um, we can't just go out there and fight our battles all alone. So if you wanted to be kind of like a spiritual laborer among people, if you wanted to be that, and you wanted to do that with like-hearted friends, I want to ask you to discuss this in your group. How would you know someone is like-hearted? How do you know? Does that question make sense? Is it? Yeah, I mean, I'm just going to leave. I'm not even going to add anything more. How do you know that they're like-hearted? And then also, let me just throw this other one in. What might be a signal that they are not like-hearted? Now, I guess I have to make a few comments. I'm sorry. What we're not talking about here is quality or value. Everybody is equally valuable in the eyes of the Lord. So we're not talking about this person's better or any of that. We're just talking about how do you know someone might have the same vision as you, and then what might be a signal that they don't? Okay? All right. What could a partnership look like with other like-hearted friends in the Nairobi context? What could it look like? 
If you were to say, yeah, these are some friends, we're kind of laboring together among the lost, what would it even look like? Does that make sense, what I'm asking? Yeah. <laughs> we asked, what? how do you know if someone's lighthearted? What are some signs they're not? Well, what would it look like if you were to sort of team up, in a sense? Okay? What would that look like? Now, let me let you discuss that. Reporting, right? That anybody wants to engage in from your group discussion. I loved three pretty big questions out of all of you. I kind of wish I could have said it all of them and listened. But does anybody want to just share with us a little bit what was the discussion like on this? I think uh, someone who said that they with the like hearted friends uh, doesn't have to be like where exactly they are because we don't want to have the same place on the bus. But maybe we could labor like at a school and uh, you know, work together. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 That's good. I think you're right. Otherwise, we all have to just go get the same job and work at the same place. <laughs> we know that's not that's not right. No. What else? Any other? Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, the issue of Nairobi came up. Mm -hmm. um, I... This little town called Nairobi. This city called Nairobi. And how busy it is and um, different and lots of people. Mm -hmm. Uh, for you to create a partnership, uh, so you have to be deliberate and intentional. Mm -hmm. Because if you decide to go and visit one, and then they get, you tell them, I don't know what the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so I have yeah, to. Yeah, this is not the village. <laughs> <laughs> you just show up. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, David was giving us an example of a very tribe where you can just go with his family and spend the night there and it's okay. Yeah. At Nairobi, it is You have to be totally deliberate. Yeah. yeah, you're not gonna. It, it's true. I mean, and some of that. It's funny. I mean, it's we're in Nairobi, so we can say Nairobi. But I'll just tell you, it's the it's the mega city dynamic. It's like in every city in the world. It's this is how it is. It's like the your biggest enemy is like the crush of everything. I mean, the traffic and the, you know all of it. Yeah. You know, on the team thing, I was thinking. Uh, do you know, like in uh, the sport track and field? Yes. Uh, you might have a 100 meter sprinter or a high jumper, right? There's different events, but they're on the same team. A basketball team, they're all on the same court doing the same thing at the same time. It's probably not realistic, a basketball team. But what about a track team? We're on the same team, but we have different events. That might be more Nairobi-ish. <laughs> Something to think about. Any other input or feedback from your time? Um, from us, I think uh, we came up with uh, the idea of, uh, in order for us to have a partnership, or uh, yeah, a partnership, we need to have fellowship. Mm -hmm. Basically, like what we're having now, in order to get to know one, mm -hmm. get to know where our heart is. Mm -hmm. In order to have that there and see the same picture that we're looking at. That is well said. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I was thinking that, um, I mean, what would it look like if a handful of maybe a few couples and then a few singles or some mix somehow realized, hey, we kind of think the same about mission and wanting to be what God wants us to be, right, where he's planted us, maybe we can get together occasionally and encourage one another, pray for each other, and keep each other on point, you know? Um, this is not, I'm not talking about a Bible study, you know, I mean, you could study the Bible, <laughs> but what we're talking about is people who want to live a certain way, right? They want to live a certain way. And you could even like encourage one another in your profession. 
and help each other in that too. I mean, that's a whole other thing. So it's not just about some ministry things, but certainly this thing of laboring with like-hearted friends. What would that look like? I wonder. So I, I'm going to sort of, on purpose, here towards the end of my time, I'm trying to leave you with questions more than like telling you what should happen. I want you need to wrestle through some of these things, and I hope I've given you some things to think about um, today. Um, but this day was mostly about what it takes to flourish for the long term, right? That's kind of what the the day was about. Another day like this, I hope you're listening, Sam and Amulo. Another day might be on how to do this with others. You know the question we just talked about for the last 50? Maybe you need a day on that sometime. What should this really look like? Or how GIPs and CIPs can work together. That might be another. Um, those are big topics. But this... <laughs> this city is full of people who have been influenced and discipled by the navigators. There's a lot of people here. A lot of people that have a lot to offer. Um, and I kind of, been, I've been here enough to kind of, this is my fifth time, by the way, not my fifth. But I've been here enough to kind of dream a dream that God might somehow knit these navigator infected people all over the city and open their eyes to what's right in front of them, you know. So I'm praying that. But to close, and I'm going to do one last thing. Let's look at Psalm 92 one more time. And this time I'm going to read it, but I'm just going to pray it over you, okay? So, Lord, we do thank you for the chance to get together and consider these things. Lord, thank you that the idea of flourishing is your idea. You want that for us. It's not like we have to convince you to allow us to flourish. You want us to flourish. And so I thank you for that. Thank you that that's what's on your heart for us. And I want to commit all these uh, friends to you in your name, that they would be the righteous who flourish like palm trees. And that they would grow like cedars of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord, flourishing in the courts of their God. Lord, that, that they would still be bearing fruit in old age and be fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is their rock and there is no wickedness in him. Amen. Amen.